Good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Serbo event today. My name is Catherine Balabanova. I'm the Regional Director of uh, Serbo Toronto and National Coordinator. And before I pass the floor to uh, our chair, Martha Harrison, I'd like to mention a couple of Zoom functions that uh, we'll use today. And that is uh, uh, Q&A and uh, simultaneous interpretation down at the bottom of your screens. Please feel free to type Q&As during the presentations or during the Q&A session, and we'll try to answer everything. However, if we uh, uh, don't have enough time, uh, please bear with us. We'll answer by email. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to draw your attention to the uh, simultaneous interpreting function, which is in front of you on the screen. Please um, use it. As well, uh, please use the Q&A function so to enable you, yourself to ask questions. Thank you so much, Catherine, and good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today to provide some brief introductory remarks uh, at this Serba Construction and Infrastructure Webinar. As Catherine mentioned, my name is Martha Harrison. I am very pleased to be the chair of the board of the Toronto chapter of Serba where I've been an active member for a number of years, and I am also a partner at the Canadian law firm McCarthy Tetro in the International Trade and Investment Group. So welcome to the Serba Eurasia Construction and Infrastructure Webinar. Uh, the goals of our event today uh, are generally to preserve and strengthen the existing ties between Canada and Eurasia and to establish new ones to the economic benefit of all trading countries in these regions in the sphere of construction and infrastructure. We know there is a lot of potential to strengthen these ties and we're happy to provide opportunities like this one to share our thoughts on how we can do this. We would like to thank Global Affairs Canada for helping us develop the program uh, of today's event as well. Also in our thanks uh, is the building show the Russian Embassy and Trade Mission, the Belarusian Chamber of Industry and Commerce, the Mongolian Construction Association, and all of those, uh, all of those organizations for working with us and really helping us to create and promote this event this year. Um, not surprisingly, like, like many other events that are usually held in person, we are, we are hosting live uh, on this webinar, and we very much appreciate the support of our partners in helping us put this together. We also appreciate the participation of our partners from the All Russian Non Governmental Organization for Small and Medium Businesses, known as the uh, Opora Russia. The webinar today has been prepared in collaboration with all of the chapters of Serba in Canada, Russia, and Kazakhstan. It's a real, true effort and a demonstration of how our regional organizations support one another in preparing and presenting what we consider to be value added material for our members. We also would like to thank all of the attendees and all of our members who continue to support the, the association in spite of these particularly challenging times. Before uh, we start, I would like to now invite uh, Valerie Maximoff Senior Trade Commissioner of the Russian Federation in Canada to say a few words of welcome as well. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, good morning, good evening uh, to everyone on behalf of the Russian Trade Mission to Canada. Allow me to welcome all the participants. The coronavirus pandemic has made adjustments to holding international meetings, so we are starting this conference in online mode. Unfortunately, this is a new normal today. We feel lack of communication between us due to COVID restrictions, and I am grateful to the server for the opportunity to discuss the current agenda online. Once the world returns to its former life, we will be happy to continue working with our partners in person. I think that the uh, international trade and cooperation development will play a significant role in recovering the, gro uh, the global economy. A few words about trade relations between Russia and Canada. Russian-Canadian trade turnover showed significant growth in 2019, increasing by more than 32% compared to 2018. 
The first half of this year was not such bright and optimistic though. Trade to Norwood compared to the same period in 2019 decreased by 34%. The COVID-19 pandemic will lead to the fact that by the end of 2020, our trade statistics will not be as good as wished, but this is a global observed trend. Uh, however, I should note that the recession is far from taking place across the entire product range. We see steady growth in a wide range uh, of goods. I'm sure that the overall situation will come to normal after loosening global restrictions caused by the pandemic. We're continuing to working on different levels to promote bilateral trade and economic relations between our countries. Online roundtable of representatives of the Canadian business community with the Deputy Minister of Industry and Trade of the Russian Federation, Alexei Gruzdiv, and the Canadian Ambassador to the Russian Federation, Alison Leclerc, took place on November 10, 2020. Also, I have to mention online video conference between the Canadian Forest Service and the Russian Federal Forestry Agency on October 14, 2020. The agenda of the online video conference with Canadian Forest Service included different aspects of cooperation in, on multilateral and bilateral formats. Both sides agreed to work within the framework of multilateral formats, including United Nations Working Group of Specialists on Boreal Forest, as well as bilateral cooperation. We express our support for the initiative to renew cooperation with the Federal Forestry Agency and reaffirm our commitment to expanding collaboration uh, on sustainable forest management. In terms of business development, we are interested in collaboration with Canadian partners, for example, in wood and housing construction, exchanging advanced technologies and deepening industrial partnerships. Wood and housing market in Russia has excellent growth potential and we're actively promoting cooperation in this sphere. We have developed a program to support individual residential construction. The volume of its financing until 2024 is almost 1.8 billion US dollars. The wooden housing construction will be the program's primary focus. Canadian companies have what to offer in this matter, uh, matter for sure. And uh, in conclusion, I would like to take this opportunity to, to invite all of you in July 2020 to Yekaterinburg uh, to the largest international industrial exhibition in Nepal. Hopefully we will finally meet in person and we'll be able to discuss the progress made since our meeting today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Valerie, and I, I echo your sentiments. I look forward to the day when we can meet again in person, but until then, uh, these online offerings are uh, a great opportunity to, to connect with, with each other and with organizations. Uh, so now I'm also pleased to invite Nurgul uh, Makimbetova, the Trade Commissioner of Russia, Belarus, Moldova, and Global Affairs Canada. Uh, yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am representing Global Affairs Canada, and as uh, Marta mentioned, I'm a Trade Commissioner for Russia, Moldova, and Belarus. I'm very happy to be here because on behalf of Global Affairs Canada, I would like to say that we truly believe that this webinar is actually uh, going to deepen our uh, ties between our two great nations, Russia and Canada. In fact, uh, based on that uh, recent, recent call, which uh, Valeria actually mentioned um, uh, with uh, Rostel Hoss, I think it was it took place in uh, October. And I would like to highlight that um, we haven't met with Rostel Hoss since 2013. So I think it's a very, very uh, big deal. And then uh, I'm very uh, pleased to see that we're meeting today as well. And then this webinar relates to uh, further our collaboration on forestry and, um, yeah, and infrastructure. So uh, in, I'm not gonna say much because Valeria already covered all my points. Thank you, Valeria. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanna welcome everyone. And I do believe this is gonna be very beneficial for our relationship.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Nuru. Uh, now I'd like to pass the floor to the moderator of today's session, Alexander Elgin, Director of Planning and Urban Design at B and H Architects. Alexander is an urban designer, designer and architect with more than 10 years of international experience in both master planning and architecture. Since completing postgraduate studies at the National School of Architecture in Paris Belleville in France, he has worked on a wide range of projects, including regional plans, multimodal transportation studies, master plans, campus plans, transit oriented developments known as TODs, uh, design guidelines, mixed use developments, multi unit housing, streetscape design, and large scale urban development projects across Canada, France, the Middle East, China, and Russia. So we are very fortunate to have such an experienced individual moderating for us today. Uh, Alexander's full bio, as well as all of the biographies of the, of the participants today, can be found on the event's webpage. So without further ado, I'm happy to pass the baton to Alexander, who will be our excellent moderator today. Thank you, Marta, so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarah, as well. And I want to welcome everybody to Serbo Eurasian Construction and Infrastructure Webinar 2020. And before we start, I would like to thank again Serbo for such extraordinary opportunity for myself and all participants having an honor to play a part at this event over years. And this year is a difficult but an exciting year for all of us. And even though the new reality demands a lot of adaptation and new ways conducting our lives, I think we should also see big opportunities ahead of us as well. Uh, dear friends, this year we're all meeting online. So please, let us be patient with the technology and of course, give some time to our great interpreters while presenting materials. We also have some time, 10 to 15 minutes for questions after each session. So, and without further ado, allow me to present our first keynote speaker for the first session of construction and infrastructure. I am pleased to invite Blaho Koyakovic, Director of the Property and Tourism Team, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. Stage is all yours, Blaho. Thank you, and good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us yet again uh, to participate uh, to this uh, amazing uh, audience with uh, well-known speakers. Uh, I'm coming from the property and tourism sector and we will try to cover in the next few minutes what we are doing and how we can work together with you both in Eurasia as well as the whole of the region where we are operating. What we are trying to do in uh, property and tourism of EBRD is really to provide the modern real estate infrastructure which is as we know essential to support the region's economic expansion and diversification. We are operating from Morocco to Mongolia. As you know, EBRD has been established almost 30 years ago in all the regions uh, where actually you have the investments and interest. And since then we have been expanded our remit also in North Africa and the Middle East. We are still the biggest investor in the region. On a yearly basis, we invest between 10 and 12 billion and real estate group, which I'm heading, is uh, one of the most business-driven, private sector-driven groups. What are the priorities that uh, we are looking at in the region? We just had a new strategy approved by the board, and it's very much focusing on green, sustainable, and I would even say post-COVID on a green, sustainable recovery. We are trying to tackle downtown in through urban regeneration, we are trying to tackle tourism and hospitality, but through inclusive tourism, by bringing both unemployed youth and especially women into the tourism sector, providing them with a career initiatives. And also we try to actually merge and bridge public and private sector by actually focusing on underused brownfield sites and clusters, which are sitting in our region for the last 30 years unused because of the failed industries or because of inability of the public sector to commercialize these sites. We have around three 
a billion of accumulated investments in the real estate, of which around one and a half billion is actually still active. And this ranges from various uh, sectors to various regions. As you can see, Central Europe and Southeast Europe actually is probably the most active for us because of the market being most developed. But on the other hand, Eastern Europe and Caucasus, as well as Central Asia, is a growing percentage and we want to do more business there. In terms of the portfolio, as I mentioned, we are really covering everything that you can imagine in a layered cake, starting from investment funds where we are acting as limited partners, going through retail and mixed use, hotels both in the city centers and as resorts, offices and warehousing, which in the last two or three months have actually become uh, the major driver of the economy. We all moved online and logistics is the most important driver for our goods to be delivered to the home. We also go into residential, especially with equity that we put to the residential partners. And sometimes we also do infrastructure projects such as marinas in countries which are actually benefiting from nautical tourism. How do we finance? As you can see from the slide here, I'm very happy to discuss particular cases. We are actually providing senior debt financing, usually in cooperation with other international or local banks. These are really guidelines. It all depends how strong is the sponsor, but we are trying to go for relatively conservative financing, which goes up to eight to 10 years. We actually are providing between 40 and 60% debt if there is very clear idea of the business plan where the cash flow will be produced and there is debt capacity of the project. When it comes to the project company, we expect to receive cost overrun guarantees from sponsors. And also, we are actually looking at sustainability through the actual projects. So one of the things that we would look for is the greening of the buildings, would be the green leases, and would be inclusion, as I said, both during the construction and the operational part of the project. We are also providing equity and we are actually one of the main equity partners to major companies operating in the region. Not only through equity funds, but also directly through the company that actually we would be a smaller equity contributor, but an important one, because we do bring a certain cloud when it comes to political security, but also a certain stamp of approval when it comes to due diligence where EBRD is comfortable to work with the sponsor and with the particular project. Our recent approaches actually are uh, really reflecting what we think is going to be the future of real estate post-COVID. And this is a very strong partnership and relationship between private and public sector, something we will hear more about from the next speaker. We have created a fund which is focusing on technical cooperation in terms of preparation for the projects that we will finance in the future, where we are working both with private and public sector stakeholders in cities of our region in order to utilize unused sites and in order to make them profitable, but actually always to keep the risk on the side of the private sector while creating benefits and dividends with no risk taken for the public sector. This means that underused infrastructure, decontaminated land and dilapidated urban fabric can actually turn itself into the new city centers. Something that we have seen in Toronto waterfront, in King's Cross in London, in Berlin, in New York, in a number of cities, which actually over the last 20 years changed their face, but also they kept their sustainability and also they kept their attraction for the youth to remain in these cities and for the employers to move to these cities. The other small initiative which we are very active with and one of the main countries where we are operating is actually Uzbekistan, is the commercialization of the cultural heritage. It is part of our tourism program, which is wide, but this particular focus is really focusing on the small cultural heritage sites which need both learning and educating of the stakeholders across the value chain when it comes not only to tourism but also to 
visa identification to digitalization and to any kind of SME inclusion in the operation and usage of the cultural heritage in tourism sense. In the next few projects, which I'm going to cover, actually, you will see the wide range of our experience. These are projects which are relatively small because our usual ticket is between 20 and 30 million, but we go down to even $300,000, as you will see in the last two projects that I will present. A couple of projects in Georgia. We have actually co financed a refurbishment of a dilapidated building in downtown Tbilisi which today is one of the most popular office uh, buildings on the Freedom Square. It's around 6,000 square meters of leasable area, and it's completely energy efficient, and it's one of the top MEP designs when it comes to office stock in Tbilisi today. Similar to it, but focusing on hospitality, is Fabrica, which used to be a Soviet era sewing factory dilapidated for many years, and today it's turned into a hot spot for not only locals but also for the tourism visits, as it has hostel for the young visitors, the restaurants, and the courtyard with a variety of food court tenants. Moving to Ukraine, in Lviv, actually we have completely refurbished another dilapidated fabric, I would say which used to be a factory, a brick factory in the center of Jewish ghetto, again, not used for the last 40 years. And with Multi, which is one of the best developers and partners that we have uh, focused on urban regeneration, we actually created a spread out retail center with around 40,000 square meters, which even through the crisis of Ukrainian uh, Russian tensions, but also in this crisis has never actually uh, undergo any stress. So the, the retail center is full and it just proves that when you are refurbishing the city centers, these are resilient sites regardless of the real estate site. These are a small couple of projects which I mentioned and they are very interesting and we are very proud of them actually because they are really cutting edge design and cutting edge ideas. Uh, this is a uh, glamorous clamping, as they call it these days, in Kyrgyzstan, in the Alley Valley. And it's a very popular destination, both for local and international uh, walking tourism. And it's one of the beautiful sites where you can actually enjoy modern yet traditional architecture in the middle of beautiful mountain. Similar one is a refurbishment of three hotels in Kiva, in Uzbekistan, where we have spent almost 2 million euro investing in training through donor funding of all the stakeholders trying to regenerate Kiva as the destination which is building on its cultural heritage history, but also which actually is bringing up to speed, becoming an interesting destination and approachable destination for the world tourism. So this is all from me. Uh, I'm going to share my contacts and the presentation, which is going to be shared later on. I'm very happy to answer any of the questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Vlaho. I think it's amazing seeing that uh, even though we're all sitting in our homes right now and thinking about the difficulties of the future and the impact of pandemic, I still think through your presentation, we might understand that the future is already here and the organization you're presenting is having the cutting edge understanding of the tendencies and also the market possibilities for all of us and the perspective how we can actually look to our nearest and further future regarding also the change of the global arena and the climate adaptation of our current situation as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like now uh, present our next uh, keynote speaker, uh, Sleminkov Evgeny, a chairman of the board, Interregional Union of Building Enterprises of Small and Medium Entrepreneurship, Apora Russia. As well, he's a general director of Techno Eco Project. Please meet uh, Evgeny. Hello, 
происходит в строительной отрасли Российской Федерации. Во-первых, я хотел бы похвалить наше Министерство строительства. Uh, hello, my dear colleagues. I'd like to share with you the most recent news of the construction industry, housing and infrastructure development in the Russian Federation. First of all, I'd like to praise our Ministry of Construction Industry uh, because of the recent progress. Uh, within the recent period, the number of the approvals uh, needed to obtain construction permit was cut in half. Thus, we no longer waste excessive uh, unnecessary time to prepare our projects. As of present time, uh, in order to uh, the time needed to obtain a construction permit is practically uh, cut in half. Uh, the main problem that our industry has to solve right now is that we still have approximately 6 million uh, of the citizens of the Russian population living in unsafe and obsolete housing. Uh, and that's the problem that we're trying to solve within the framework of our national development programs. Altogether, we have 13 of such programs. Practically each of them, to some degree, includes an element of construction or infrastructure development. But most importantly for us are certainly housing and urban infrastructure developments. And our second program involves uh, safe and quality highways. But I'd like to highlight the program of housing and urban infrastructure uh, development. Uh, Sure, uh, we understand perfectly well that it's impossible to solve the problem of uh, unsafe and obsolete housing by a pointed method. method. In order to solve these problems, uh, we have created two major institutes in our country, uh, the National Housing Corporation, so-called DOM-RF, uh, that's conducting housing renovation, and the second institute is uh, implementing the program of housing infrastructure that's responsible for relocating those living in the obsolete and unsafe housing. Oh, we are uh, presently completing the second stage of the program of relocating the former residents of unsafe and uh, housing. And this year, we've made the decision not to do it by uh, a highly localized method, but to renovate sufficiently large areas at once. Uh, what are the advantages? First of all, we not only build a new modern housing, we are in fact completely changing all engineering infrastructure. We renew the social structure, we provide complete landscaping, and apart from that, uh, we always take into account uh, the future long-term growth, growth of a certain region or settlement, because uh, yes, it's important to provide a new housing, but it's and good uh, living conditions, but it's just as well uh, to have employment opportunities there. Uh, and such programs are presently working practically in all major cities of the Russian Federation. Uh, naturally, it's quite difficult to solve uh, such programs without support from the government, from the state. So there are certain banks uh, that are involved in financing the process of uh, design and uh, further stages uh, of these projects. And naturally, we're also involving economic mechanisms, such as market mechanism that allows us to pay for a part of the renovation work uh, by selling a part of the new uh, newly built housing. At present, we are building approximately 80 million square me meters of housing per, uh, annually. Uh, it is noteworthy that this year, in spite of the pandemic, we will also demonstrate growth. But in order to achieve a modern level of housing availability for the population, we've got to achieve something like 120 million of square feet uh, or square meters uh, built annually. I've got to mention that approximately 65 or 70% uh, of the new housing are high-rise buildings, and all the rest 
are uh, private homes, family houses, or individual construction. When it comes to private housing developments, we are also having positive dynamics because a larger part of the problems uh, of resettlement and renovation in rural areas and in minor townships has to be solved primarily uh, with family homes and low-rise housing. So the local systems uh, are developing for power supply, for sewage, and for water supply. And all of that permits us to create more than just new housing, but a whole new urban infrastructure. Uh, I've got to tell you uh, that uh, such pilot projects were successfully uh, implemented in Moscow and Kazakhstan in a number of regions in Russia, and presently they are being extended to all of the territory of the Russian Federation. Naturally, the pandemic had in some way uh, influenced our life, and it changed it not uh, to the better, though in some aspects it was probably to the better. At least we started using more of modern telecommunication technologies, and our conference uh, webinar is an obvious proof of that. Uh, we've conducted an analysis of the present condition of our medical services and in particular we the builders got involved in solving present day tasks relating to the pandemic thus on the 8th of on 9th of november we've opened a new facility here in moscow uh, that manufactures coronavirus testing systems by the end of the year uh, is going to reach the capacity of 1.5 million units per month. And probably this pandemic permitted us to evaluate our readiness, uh, including the readiness of the construction branch of the industry to solve the problems under such uh, stressful conditions. And so far we're coping well. In conclusion, I'd like to mention the following. As a general rule, in order to promote international relations, Russia uh, is uh, usually organizing regular business missions, and presently we are preparing a business mission to Canada, uh, circumstances permitting. Uh, it is our pleasure to invite both Canadian and probably other participants of our today's webinar to come with a business mission to the Russian Federation. Uh, you may get in touch with me. You may prepare your agenda and your uh, points of interest, and I'm quite sure that we'll make it sooner or later. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Evgeny, for your amazingly uh, in Formative speech, and I want to thank you as well because I, um, from my personal experience working back to Moscow and Russia, I see that uh, our understanding and my understanding back to 2012, 2010, as a perspective of high vision ideas and understanding that changes can be done first only on the high level, on the level of the government, are now on the full speed understanding and getting into the small scales as well. Thank you so much for your presentation and I hope we can collaborate in the future as well. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I wanted to present our last but not, not least keynote speaker. I want to invite uh, Tursanbaev Dalgat, Vice President, Public-Private Partnership Center in Kazakhstan. Please welcome Dalgat. Добрый вечер, дорогие коллеги. Я извиняюсь за опоздание немного. Случились кое-какие обстоятельства. Таскен, если возможно, включите, пожалуйста, презентацию, если она есть. Good evening, my dear colleagues. Uh, I'm really sorry that I'm late due to some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, Таскен, will you please start the presentation? Uh, and in the meantime, uh, before the presentation, let me introduce myself. My name is Talgat Tursunbaev. I am the Vice President uh, of the Public-Private Partnership Development Center of Kazakhstan. 
uh, as of present, uh, the mechanism of private-public partnership is a very popular one, and it's developing very fast, uh, especially for infrastructure projects, and in general, in the sphere of construction and development within the territory of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Before I go to the very core of my presentation, I'd like to make a very brief review of the statistics. Taskin, please, the next slide. Uh, as of the present day, which is November 1st, 2020, uh, we have a total of 824 current projects for the grand total of practically 2 trillion tenge. Uh, a total number of private partners investors are involved in these 824 projects, including consortiums and foreign investors. Uh, it's noteworthy that out of this 545 private investors, over 50 investors, are the companies with international participation or uh, foreign companies. And within the framework of these projects, we have over 915 billion tenge in investments. The next slide, please. We have taken certain measures uh, in order to protect the investors and to get the investors interested in the mechanism of private-public partnerships. Uh, to make that mechanism popular as a whole, as it is a relatively new one, because the whole bulk of such projects have been implemented only after 2015, while the law on PPPs was put in place. Before that, starting 90s, we had uh, the law on concessions, and not too many uh, projects have been implemented under that particular law. So as of today, uh, in order to attract the investors and to protect them from factors, uh, including the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there is a legislation in place that is actively practiced and uh, proved to be viable on the mechanisms like protection of PPP budgetary funds from sequestration, meaning that we will understand that there exist such facts as reviewing of the expenditures. Uh, let's say uh, if the investor uh, invests in a certain project and uh, it takes uh, from five to seven or 15 years to get the return, uh, there is a risk that the government can review such expenditures in the future. However, there is no such risk in Kazakhstan at present based on the existing budgetary code, which is the principal regulatory document uh, on finances in the Republic of Kazakhstan. The second mechanism involves an early termination fee. We are presently encountering uh, numerous projects influenced in some way by the pandemic. When such private-public uh, partnership agreements are being dissolved, in, including uh, under force majeure or act of God clause, the state is fulfilling all of its obligations, compensating to the private partners all of their investments uh, for such premature dissolution, including the lost profit. Uh, so far, it's working well, and we've proved it to ourselves, and we've made the mechanism more streamlined. Uh, st streamline. Within the framework of investor protection, there is now a guarantee uh, also of consumption for certain types of services. So, the government is no longer purchasing just the asset under construction, but also the service. We can return to that later on, and that's quite interesting. So, the government no longer considers a highway or a facility uh, as an end product, but uh, also uh, the service for the population. And it's up to the investor to find the best way to achieve uh, the set quality. Uh, so now we are also seeing the new distribution of risks within such projects. Uh, when the government is paying for a service, the guarantee of consumption becomes a very important non-financial uh, instrument that protects the private partner from the future risks. Sure, as long as the private partner is fulfilling all the obligations under the agreement. Uh, international arbitration is also working uh, when we are uh, dealing with foreign investors. Uh, we've now got uh, International Financial Center of Astana, where we register all of our foreign partners. Uh, so all potential disputes uh, from now on may also be resolved based on the international law. Next slide, please.
one slide back please yes this one and as a main method of returning the money within private public partnership projects by the way during the recent legal forums within the territory of kazakhstan uh, the legal experts have noted that such agreements are the most reliable ones that fully protect the investors thus one of the main types of payments by the state from budgetary uh, funds is the compensation of the investors expenses paid after the onset of operational use uh, within uh, let's say starting five years and we always return up to 100 percent of investors expenses and by the way they are always mirrored uh, by the loan repayment schedule uh, we may also include a creditor as a private partner uh, and also as a part of an agreement, we may include currency mechanisms taking into account that the national currency uh, of Kazakhstan is somewhat volatile. So we may include currency mechanisms for regulating the currency risks. Uh, we are also compensating operational expenses such as maintenance expenses for these facilities, etc. And certainly the amounts of such uh, payments are uh, considered in every detail at the stage of project planning as it's possible to uh, provide paid services as well to the partners uh, and uh, there are certain fees collected from the population etc uh, so such payments are final point of any economical model And at present, we start to approach such projects from the standpoint of whether there is a possibility to pay for the, these projects from non-public uh, funds. In general, as of today, uh, last year, in the prior year, uh, there were financial audits of all uh, private-public partnership agreements, and the resulting recommendations were very useful. They permitted us to avoid future risks, and at present, where uh, at the threshold and as good as there were so numerous audits we've seen our mistakes uh, in development of such projects we've seen the growth potential and uh, we've also seen the contact points with the foreign and local investors as of today the most important direction that the state is developing uh, is the direction of non-financial types of support of the investors such as uh, grants of land plots uh, to investors or property management rights for up to 30 years and other far more complex methods. And we are currently considering the financial measures of support only as the last resort. Uh, in any way, each public-private partnership project and agreement has to pay back and that's the basis of the law. Uh, as a whole, out of 824 private-public partnership projects at present, over 70 of them include either an element of a new development or modernization or reconstruction. So that's a very interesting topic. And the law uh, includes the projects that also include, apart from services, the stage of investing. Uh, modernization, capital repairs, or development. I would like to mention that whenever we have interested parties, there is always a possibility to find the points of mutual interest, to discuss the problems in Kazakhstan uh, and the experience of the foreign investors, and to start planning one or multiple projects. And there's also a pipeline of the existing public-private partnership projects based on the problems that have to be solved uh, using this particular mechanism. And that also may be discussed. Uh, and that's all that I wanted to tell you. And thank you very much for your attention. Great presentation. And and before uh, we, we wanna chat a little bit about the results of KCBC Construction Infrastructure Working Group that was, uh, conducted on the 17th of November. I want to thank you again, Tal Talgat, for your, sorry, I didn't put a video on. <laughs> thank you uh, for your presentation. And just mentioned you that P3 projects are actually the, the main project now in overall Canadian market. And I just let you know that uh, the major problem now, and maybe this will be part of our discussion during the question period, 
that we are trying now to jump into the small size of project as well with the same structures, not only as Val has mentioned, project as Waterfront Toronto or Crossing King in uh, UK, but also small size project. And the major uh, question now, how we also not protecting only financing, but also performer and innovation component for the future project as well, which actually really tied it up to the financial uh, uh, part of it as well. So that's for the next uh, discussion. And now I want to invite um, uh, Galiman Jan Mataev to introduce the results of uh, the KCBC Construction Infrastructure Working Group session. Uh, please uh, invite, uh, please welcome uh, Galima Jan. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Galim Jan Mataev. I am a representative of a national company Kazakh Invest in the US and Canada. And uh, as, uh, as Alex explained, I am uh, uh, recently uh, was, uh, was uh, honored as a co-chair of the Kazakhstan-Canada uh, Business Council and uh, co-chair of the uh, working group uh, for, for the construction and uh, infrastructure. And just recently, about uh, 10 days ago, we, uh, we did uh, very lot, uh, a lot of job concerning a lot of discussions and we did it on the, our working group and uh, on the plenary session of CERBA. And just, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not a planned speaker today. And thank you uh, for this opportunity to share just some results of our, our working group. And uh, we uh, uh, we see uh, our working group together with our colleagues from government bodies, from the Canadian Canadian side and Kazakhstan side. We see opportunities, uh, great opportunities in this sector. Uh, first of all, it's definitely technology transfer. And uh, it means uh, that Kazakhstan can enhance awareness of uh, Canada's uh, wood-based building technology and using uh, support of relevant codes and technical requirements for Kazakhstan. And then implementation uh, of engineering expertise required for safe and sustainable application of wood construction at residential, social, or and infrastructural projects. Other ones, uh, it's definitely modern urban environment and affordable living collaboration on uh, implementation of best practices, uh, Canadian best practices for planning, design, construction, and management of affordable residential housing, implementation of energy efficient approaches in municipal construction and management of municipal infrastructure, ensuring cost and energy efficiency. And definitely, uh, as a one uh, direction, it's participation Canadian companies in priority infrastructure projects available with PPP Center, which uh, my colleague Talgat already mentioned, and using uh, using uh, supporting Kazakh Invest and other agencies, developing a partnership with national construction companies, and uh, like. Uh, Last one, but it's not uh, less important, uh, definitely professional knowledge exchange between Canadian and uh, Kazakhstan companies and governmental organization and agencies. And uh, based on these directions, we uh, like defined uh, together with our colleagues, uh, our roadmap, roadmap, which includes uh, some next steps. And we are planning uh, on December and January uh, identify, for example, potential partners in Canada, in Kazakhstan, for each of uh, listed opportunities with relevant contacts uh, responsible for cooperation. And also we are planning to identify group of Kazakhstan companies and organizational organizations interested in expanding their awareness of Canadian building technologies and participation at the Canada uh, expert supported program on the margins of Buildix uh, 2021. And also we are planning uh, uh, at the February uh, develop list of national infrastructure project in Kazakhstan of potential interest or a partnership for, for Canadian companies. Uh, definitely we are planning uh, initial uh, initiate exchange uh, for interregional cooperation, uh, for example, between the 
province of British Columbia and Akimat of Almaty, with mutually agreed uh, with mutually agreed plan of activities focused on promotion of healthy healthy urban environment and smart cities concept. And as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, planning to develop long-term program of professional knowledge exchange in construction and infrastructure sectors, including technologies, government support programs, uh, financial mechanism, and uh, applicable federal, uh, regional, and municipal level policies. Thank you for your attention. If you have some questions, I will be happy to answer for that. Uh, thank you, Galema Jan, for your presentation, even though it wasn't uh, <laughs> expected, but now we have you here and I see this is extremely important for all of us understanding that even though pandemic might brought some difficulties to our everyday lives, we see actually with this and you uh, opportunity talking all together that problems we all have around the globe are really similar. So it's all actually about the transfer of knowledge we have on each side of the globe and how we actually collaboratively go for the better future for all of us uh, combined. Uh, now I would like also to present our panelists, but they're not part of the session panelist discussion. Uh, these are Bill Hutchinson, who is Distinguished Research Fellow at the University of Toronto, Moon School of Global Affairs and Public Policy Chair and CEO Hutchinson Management International, Gulmira Tol Tolgambayeva, founder and owner of the Green Tower Group of Companies Triumph Business Center, and Mira Toltaev, Business Development Manager, BI Construction Eng Engineering. So, uh, they will help us with questions. So please, uh, I would like to open the floor for any questions uh, our audience have currently, so we can collaboratively go and discuss the underlying uh, presentation that we heard recently. Thank you so much. I have a question, if I may. Uh, I was very interested to listen just a minute ago to the increased uh, trade activities uh, with Kazakhstan and the promotion of it. I spent quite a lot of time. I spent quite a lot of time in uh, Kazakhstan and uh, helping what was then Astana, now near Sultan. Uh, after the president of Kazakhstan issued a decree that he wanted Astana to be one of the world's top 50 smart cities in about two years. So this was before the expo. Um, I happened to be speaking in Kazakhstan at that time on an economic uh, development program and uh, people knew that I'd been doing smart cities for about 23 years, uh, including the Waterfront Toronto. Uh, so uh, we ended up with a contract to work with the city and uh, we were very pleased that within two, less than two years I had uh, Astana winning a worldwide agreement and uh, acknowledgement that they were number 22 standing, 22 uh, community in a worldwide competition for the smartest city in the world. So uh, the president and the mayor at the time were quite pleased. But I think there's a lot of opportunity and I look forward to chatting with you, sir, uh, sometime after this uh, to talk about some further activities with Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for this uh, direction of potential question. And I think your perspective is really important to see that Kazakhstan now on the world stage is a really important player. So please, is there any other questions we have around the uh, audience? I'll ask another question if, uh, if you have a couple of minutes. Sure. <clears throat> This was our first speaker. Uh, we're talking about the European Bank. I think everybody knows that there's going to be, uh, post COVID 19, there's going to be a lot of changes. <clears throat> One of the changes that may happen 
is there will not be a requirement for quite as much business office space. Uh, certainly this is true in Toronto. And uh, people now are starting to look at how might we reconstruct or reuse existing space. Uh, one challenge in Toronto um, is the issue of uh, low cost or social housing. We're very, very short of that. And people are already looking to see if there's some way that perhaps some of our business office buildings could be restructured <clears throat> for social housing. I'm just wondering from our existing open speakers, in particular the European Bank, if you've seen any likely shifts in your market uh, to deal more with social housing. Uh, I didn't hear any projects on that one. And uh, any uh, restructuring or reuse of some of your existing space, perhaps in the big cities, as a result of um, COVID-19 and when it disappears, hopefully. So that's my question. Thank you, Bill. Um, what we are seeing actually is everybody's trying to guess at the moment. So nobody is really sure where this pandemic is going and when is it going to end. Um, right. With the vaccine being rolled out, everybody hopes that this is going to be the end of it. But then we see that the second wave is rolling into the third wave towards Christmas and New Year. And all our clients and actually partners with whom we also have a number of office buildings under construction are actually actively redesigning. And this is probably the first response that we see on the market. Redesigning in a sense that they are putting all the meeting rooms at the bottom of the buildings in order not to come to mixing with the permanent employees. In a sense, separating the elevators, if that is still possible under construction. And the next thing which you mentioned is turning some of the buildings which were supposed to be office buildings into residential. Because the feeling is that the rollover of tenants in all the major cities is going to be less than expected because of the efficiency of working from home. So there are two ways that we experience this change. One is that some actually developers starting to combine office with residential in the same building in a way actually answering to this need of having more space but not working from home yet working in a comfortable environment which doesn't include traveling and the other way actually or the other uh, phenomenon that we are trying to understand is a little bit we just actually had it in uh, uh, in the papers in lisbon lisbon decided to buy 5,000 apartments uh, from the individual renters and actually turn them into social housing because it seems that cities like Lisbon are looking at the changes also in the Airbnb culture. So office developers, to me, it seems are they are going and they will be approaching the cities and the public municipalities trying to make the deal at least for the long let if not the sale. So your assumption, I think, is very much um, spot on. Uh, thank you, Vlaho, and of course, Bill, for your question. And I guess to summarize, the major point is actually, we understand really clear that flexibility is a major point right now. And to go for the future, we have to be as flexible as possible. Uh, now I want to uh, change the gear and uh, start our next session, which will be dedicated to forest and wood manufacturing. So uh, let's move on. And our next speaker will be Errol Karajai Bailey, who is the principal scientist at PF, uh, FPI Innovation. So uh, let's uh, invite Errol to our floor and uh, please welcome. Thank you, Alex. I'm just sharing my screen right now. Okay. Can you see my screen, Alex? Yes, we can see. It's perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I will talk about. Now we are getting into the technical side, I guess. I will talk about the renaissance of wood construction 
is underway in a number of countries that I will show you. And uh, I think uh, listening to the other speakers, uh, I guess many countries can benefit from the developments uh, of uh, wood construction in Canada. And this work is part of a larger project that I am presenting you. It's, it's, it's uh, entitled Expanding Wood Use Towards 2025. And it is supported by our stakeholders listed here. First, I start with why Renaissance? Why am I using this uh, the term? And uh, over a century ago, at the end of 19th century, the beginning of 20th century, there were quite a bit uh, heavy timber. We call them brick and timber buildings. You can see here the building. Uh, these buildings are uh, outside is masonry, but inside is all heavy timber. And that was the norm at the beginning of 20th century. This building is in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's nine stories and it's 115 years old. It's interesting, the discussion was taking place. This building was actually originally, wasn't an office building, but now it is converted to an office building. And high tech companies, they like to lease these buildings nowadays. But what happened in the 20th century, by the half mid 20th century, Concrete buildings took over and uh, basically this market. I will come to the other wood, uh, wood systems which are uh, keeping themselves uh, in the market. So with the advent of engineered wood products and systems and connections and the push for sustainable construction solutions, cities, Mass timber is having a comeback in the 21st century. And this is the story that I will share with you today. Wood construction has very good attributes and I'm not gonna dwell on many of them here, but I give you an example of the naturally resistant earth against earthquake attribute. It's a very light material with respect to other materials such as concrete and masonry. And it is able to ride the earthquakes quite well, which is well documented. So any country having an earthquake zone, wood construction is perfect solution for it. I will come back to that a bit later on. Now what's going, where the wood-based solution systems are gaining more traction and Canada is one of the leading countries. And it's happening in basically Canada, US, many European countries. And Japan. Now moving on to the systems. I will present you two systems. One is light wood frame and the other one is mass timber or we used to call it heavy timber bigger, bigger uh, sections. Light wood is something like two system is called a two inch by four inch or five centimeter by 10 centimeter sections, smaller dimension lumber. And as you can see, in this case, uh, two workers are able to carry, lift a wall. That's the reason and usually in a house construction, it doesn't require a crane to build the building. And this is lending itself extremely well to prefabrication, in, in particular in Europe. And uh, there's lots of companies are able to ship these prefabricated walls into the job site. Now, the, the thing is, most single family housing in Canada and the US and Scandinavia is light wood frame construction. When I say most, it's about 
So millions of buildings, houses are being built with this system. And then uh, this is actually going back quite a bit. What happened in the last decade or so in Canada, we were building these buildings up to four stories, housing, single family housing and apartment buildings up to three, four stories. Until the last decade, now this, there, there was a, a building code change in 2015. And then now Canada is able to go to five and six stories. And within five years after the building code change, I can report to you that there are over 500 buildings in Canada built, five and six story buildings built. And this is a remarkable thing. These are not demonstration buildings. It's simply, it's, we have the infrastructure for light frame buildings in Canada, where we have the design capacity, actually some of our designers are designing buildings elsewhere outside Canada, because we have this capacity, we have the manufacturing capacity. And then of course, the sustainable forestry, which is a must to be able to move on, move on to uh, basically wood construction in anywhere. Now I'm moving on to mass timber, which is actually very exciting development happening worldwide. And by mass timber, we, we, are, uh, we mean larger sections, bigger members, usually uh, glued together. Into, and I'm, I have a little, and there is a race going on in the world. And there is an example here in Finland. It, it was an eight story building. And then actually there was a nine story building I'm missing here in London, which was built in 2009. And London has quite a few buildings by the way. And then this is Melbourne, 10 story building. And then in Norwegian bridge designers, they designed some very interesting buildings with braces outside the building. You can see the braces here. And that is basically the lateral system. And this building is 14 story in Norway. In Canada in 2017, this is a 18 story uh, student residence at University of British Columbia. The first story is concrete and 17 story of mass timber. And it has two concrete cores in it. We call it a hybrid building in that sense. This is uh, uh, again, 18 story, very high building in Norway. It does have some concrete floors towards the top. And finally, this is a building in Vienna, Austria, a 24 story ho ho building. And there, most of them are using different systems and that's the reason there is a race going on, but it's a very exciting development. And some of these building types probably are going to be starting, started to be repeated. For instance, this one uh, in Melbourne, it started actually in London and it was, a, I will describe to you, it was a mostly a CLT, which is cross laminated building. Uh, building. Now, one of the obstacles that you may have is the regulatory acceptance. Uh, most codes allow acceptable solutions and alternate solutions. You know, you can do an alternate solution as long as you convince the authority having jurisdiction. And most codes, building codes, or in the case of Europe, uh, construction directors, they have material design codes, steel and concrete and wood and masonry. One interesting part in the regulatory acceptance that I would like to share, which is quite unique to Canada and US, is housing codes are different than codes for larger buildings. The housing codes and small building codes, for instance, they are more recipe based, based and they don't necessarily require a, a huge design team. Usually a house designer is involved and basically the recipe is such a way that uh, a technologist team can design and finish the building. 
usually in high seismic and high wind areas, structural engineer has to sign off on the lateral system. And that's about it. Large buildings, on the other hand, they are, of course, requiring a full design team. This is quite important for anybody is thinking of adapting something from North America. I'm involved in discussions in Turkey, actually, and I made the suggestion to them that they should consider this separation because there are millions of buildings or houses being built using this type of codes, recipe-based codes. I'm going to move on to a multidisciplinary approach that we are taking at FP Innovations. FP Innovations is Canada's forest products laboratory, basically. And uh, um, we are taking a multidisciplinary approach. I'm a structural engineer by profession, but it, it, took, it didn't take too long for me to see that, for instance, to get a good acoustical behavior you have to loosen the building. On the other hand, for that doesn't match with, with structural objectives. So the whole design actually is a balance of different attributes, satisfying them. So in that sense, what we have done is we have gathered, this is again happened in the last decade or so. We are gathering information, not from our own resources, but through, from the world and engaging design and construction community and putting some peer reviewed multidisciplinary handbooks. And this is this one just released. You can download it free of charge from this website here, or you can buy a paper copy from the Amazon. This one is about cross laminated timber, this product here, the slabs and the walls here you can see. And this product is considered the game changer, if you will, in the mass timber movement that we are observing right now. And you can find everything about that product. Plus, at the very end, we have a design example of an eight-story mass timber buildings with ululem columns and beams and cross-laminated tim uh, timber walls and slabs. I highly recommend anybody is interested in mass timber. It is a good publication to take a look. We do have other publications by then. I'm gonna just wrap up with saying that 21st century is experiencing a renaissance in the mass timber construction. And what you have right now is wealth of engineered wood products, which goes to both light frame and mass timber buildings. And actually those two, two systems are getting merged a bit. For instance, we are seeing some uh, elevator shafts, stairwells from cross laminated timber in light frame buildings and advanced technologies, both for instance, building information modeling, as well as uh, prefabrication and design hardware, they are all available. And there are numerous hybrid possibilities with mixing the wood, concrete, and steel. So in that sense, having a wood construction strategy in any country, I think it's well worth to look. And there is a lot of knowledge out there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Errol, for such an amazing presentation. And I'm sure the wood is game changer nowadays and it's actually game coming back because wood is actually always was there thank you again and i want to uh, present now a new team player because uh, uh, we had a little bit changes in our plans so grigory gennadievich gusev head of department of forestry pulp and paper and woodworking industry of the department of light industry and timber industry of the ministry of industry and trade of russia will present um, his stuff right now. Please welcome uh, Grigory on our stage. Thank you. Коллеги, добрый день. Мы готовы начать наш доклад. Good day, colleagues. Uh, do you hear us? We're prepared to start our presentation. Yes, we can hear you. Please, please be, begin. All right, thank you. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, please begin. Yeah. Thank you. 
so I've listened to several presentations and uh, it um, uh, was quite interesting. I'll talk about the wood construction a bit later on, but now let me talk about the forestry uh, in the Russian Federation. If I speak too fast, uh, please interpreters let me know. It's true that uh, over the past five years, the forestry in Russia showed depressive results uh, that is to do with the growth in the world market uh, as well as our internal uh, legislation uh, regulation in uh, the uh, federal policy which allowed the Russian uh, forestry um, enterprises uh, and uh, take part at the WTO and some of the national goals that were set ever since 2018 for the expert. Uh, our sphere is uh, export oriented, absolutely, and many Russian forestry companies are world leaders and in the top uh, companies in their own area. Sigeja and Cezanne uh, that do, that makes some um, uh, birch plywood and the exports around the world, including North North America. And uh, uh, I discovered that uh, the bridge in Vancouver was built uh, uh, using Russian uh, plywood. Now you see some of the statistics, that's uh, uh, the volume of internal production on the top left. Uh, of uh, the consumption export, etc., grew, grew by over 10% in uh, in 2019. Obviously, uh, the statistics had, uh, slowed down. Uh, uh, there was a, a trade war between China and and the US, uh, and the scope uh, and the volume has fallen, and some of the prices too as well. Uh, now, 2020, it's obvious, but we are expecting a significant uh, growth in 2021 and uh, a number of years ahead. So I believe that we can uh, find uh, lots of areas of cooperation. As far as the structure of uh, production in the forestry of Russia, on the right, it's 2019. The majority is taken by uh, uh, the timber, more than 30%. It's the pulp and paper, that's the cardboard and cellulose, uh, as well as Russian furniture, um, as far as the um, the, the cost uh, and, uh, and quality uh, is a very good value. It's exported to European markets, to Asian markets, uh, and is well accepted. Uh, around the world. So this is structure of main uh, types of uh, products. Uh, we can send you this presentation later on without dwelling. As far as the expert, uh, um, the structure of expert of main products uh, of uh, forestry products and timber in Russia, uh, mostly it's, it's the furniture, it's the plywood, uh, uh, and uh, every year production and export of uh, uh, pellets, um, fuel pellets uh, uh, growed by uh, uh, more than 10%. Uh, we can see up to 15%, uh, the export has grown of this particular product uh, around the world. And uh, our colleagues, I believe in North America um, pin, great hopes for this particular segment of the market. Production index, what's, uh, what we see as far as the contribution of forestry into the uh, uh, domestic uh, product. Uh, at the national level, we set the goal that this contribution of the forestry has to be no less than 1% by 2030, 30, but uh, we are actually going ahead of ourselves and our plans. Uh, and um, um, we are going to uh, reach that goal much faster. 
And uh, in, compared to Canada, I believe it's a several percent um, in Canada, the forestry uh, and the gross domestic product. But uh, this is a goal we set for ourselves. Uh, we enjoy a number of uh, um, supporting regulations and credits, uh, discounted credits for new investment projects. And we even have uh, uh, support uh, for construction of uh, wooden buildings. Uh, we have subsidized part uh, of the credit, uh, part of the interest for a um, wooden building that's been uh, prefabricated uh, completely at, at a factory um, because obviously there are uh, projects, uh, uh, private projects when, uh, when uh, people are buying, uh, uh, you know, they uh, uh, involve their friends to, to build individual houses, but we are trying to do this on a sort of larger industrial scale. And this is uh, a map of investment projects in the Russian Federation over the past uh, 10 years and uh, every month. Uh, there are regions, certain regions. Uh, um, we see opening new enterprises and uh, 155 enterprises over the past uh, 10 years and this uh, number is keeps growing. These are key parameters in Russia. There is, uh, in Russia, there's a national strategic document um, by the decree of uh, the Russian government. It uh, says the strategy of uh, development of forestry uh, by 2030, adopted in uh, uh, 2018. And at the end of uh, 2020, we already see need to introduce certain corrections and I think it's a correct position. It's the right position because any strategy sometimes is subject to, uh, depending on various uh, uh, various uh, changes happening in the world, we needs to be corrected. The basic parameters are the same. Uh, uh, the goal is to add, uh, increase added value in forestry, increase the um, um, employment, uh, and I talked about the percentage in the gross domestic product and uh, um, increase the taxes that are contributed to the um, uh, uh, federal budget uh, from the enterprises uh, in the, our forest industry. And that's about it. Uh, thank you very much. Now, as far as the um, timber wood construction, I'm sorry, Guri. We have one more speaker. And if we'll have time for questions, we will stay and eventually we can uh, use your knowledge to also to comment because next speaker is actually Yuri Kulikov, who is a structural and project engineer at Fast Plus App from Vancouver. And he will be actually talking about the interpretation and the using of uh, wood structure in the, in the building uh, sense. So I think it's worth listening to him first and we'll see we'll have time to comment. If not, we will continue afterwards online with all our comments and questions later on. Thank you and uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Alex, I think you unmuted, but uh, I would imagine you are trying to get me on the floor here. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for, for your time and waiting for <laughs> for your uh, turn. So yeah, so Yuri Kulikov is a structural, as I have mentioned, and project engineer at Fast Plus App. He's from Vancouver and will talk about his experience as engineer with the wood structure uh, projects. Uh, so please meet Yuri and let's listen what he has to say. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Can you hear me well? Can you see my presentation here as well? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Good. Um, I'll pick up on what Grigori was talking at the moment, uh, just a moment ago. Um, I think so far we've heard, um, you know, big picture tendencies in the market from, from our investors, from governments. We also had a really nice uh, crash course in mass timber from Arrow. And what I'll try to do here is to build a bridge between um, sustainable cities and wood construction. 
sustainable cities are made of sustainable buildings. And we know that uh, construction industry contributes significant amount of carbon emission into the atmosphere. And that's the biggest challenge for, for the construction industry in the moment and in the future to reduce those emissions. Uh, today, we, for the most part, we live in the economy of um, carbon emission, but it's changing and it's not going to be a future. And very soon, all of us, in some way or another, will be paying for each kilogram of carbon that we use. And perhaps the, the most direct way that we are aware of it at the moment is carbon taxation, which means for construction industry, for developers, for investors, it's not the matter of doing the right thing, but it's the matter will become and is becoming a matter of profitability. So where does carbon, how carbon relates to buildings? And it's good to uh, identify two different types of carbon. The first uh, that we call embodied carbon is the energy and the um, carbon emission that go for fabrication, transportation, and construction industry. So let's call it construction. The second part of carbon that relates to building is operational carbon that's energy related to operating building throughout its uh, lifespan. As of today, buildings or operational carbon contribute 28% of the global carbon emissions. Where embodied carbon, which we call construction industry, contributes 11%. So two notes to take here. Firstly, the 40% of all global carbon emissions are associated with building. So we really have an opportunity and we will have to make a change uh, in the world by making our buildings way more carbon efficient. Second thing to note here is at the moment, uh, operational carbon is about two and a half times uh, bigger than carbon that goes into the construction. But over the next 30 years, it's gonna change. Their embodied carbon or energy that goes into construction will become equal to the energy that we've been using operating the buildings. The main reason for that is over the ten, last, let's say 20 years, the issue of operational carbon was very well identified and we see huge growth of energy efficient building throughout the world. It's becoming a norm. However, by doing that, we totally ignore or under estimate the amount of carbon that goes into the construction, to the material, into the processes. And this is something that the industry has realized only a few years ago. And this is a big push and the big change that we're all going to see. Uh, there are many different strategies on how we can tackle the problem. And all these strategies should be working together in order to achieve uh, carbon reduced, carbon efficient, and perhaps one day um, carbon neutral construction industry. Um, as, as a topic of today, so wood construction, one of the ways to get there is through um, using wood products in the construction industry, specifically in the housing uh, market. Why is that? Uh, the bigger thing about wood, it's a renewable material, which means we can re recreate this material significantly faster than any other building material known as. The second thing, when wood grows, it takes carbon out of atmosphere. So it's a way of sequestering or storing the carbon. We need to learn how to properly use this product and how to properly recycle this material. And the carbon taken out of atmosphere will never go on and go back into the environment. Now, not all wood is good way in terms of building in industry. It only makes sense to call wood as sustainable material if we treating our forestry in a sustainable way. And it's nice to see that uh, countries like Russia and Belarus are really one of the leaders to uh, creating certified forestry. We've seen from previous presentation that, that there's a lot of export going um, from Russia to other countries. And the bigger contributor of the export seems like being um, energy materials, but also paper and pulp and paper. It would be nice to see in the future where we start using this wood into the construction industry. 
uh, by these numbers, we can see that the resources are there, material is there. It's the matter of applying a technology and start using that material internally within the country. We've learned over the last few years, and it's a fact now, and it's been proven by many studies, um, that um, building made of wood has are way more significant and abundant efficient, meaning that there's significant reduction of embodied carbon throughout the construction uh, process. Uh, when we compare the same building, especially we're talking up to 10, 12 stories, same architectural layout, same base, same purposes. If we compare wood building with conventional baseline concrete or um, steel building, we see multiple benefits and multiple reduction of embodied carbon that goes into the construction of those buildings. Perhaps that's why uh, global industry, construction industry is picking up on this. Uh, from this graph, you can see the last 10 years, we've seen significant increase in mass timber production all over the world. And the projection are telling that it will be growing exponentially. So for that, let's watch out for that dotted line in the future. Uh, that will be changing our, uh, the way we construct buildings. It also works to note where the ma majority of the production of mass timber happening in the moment. We can see uh, majority of it is in Europe uh, for the most part due to the huge um, history of wood production in Switzerland, Austria, Russia as well. However, we need to know that um, this pie has been changing. Uh, North America is catching up and it's going to be producing more and more wood but well, once Asia and Africa is on the map as well, we will see this uh, chart, pie chart will be significantly changing by a um, huge amount of wood coming from Asia and Africa as well. Now, we've uh, brought up a few times the topic of uh, affordable housing um, and how, do you, how to create affordable, efficient housing in the um, modern urban environments without disturbing uh, urban uh, life. Uh, wood products, since wood construction tend to perfectly fit in uh, for, that, uh, for that goal. Um, with current technology, we're so good at um, prefabricating elements, separate uh, pieces and parts outside of the site, somewhere in a sheltered, well-controlled environment, and then getting it on site, putting it together very quickly, minimizing any disturbances. Now, we all know about um, uh, efficiency of Eastern Bloc uh, panel construction. Um, those were economical, maybe not very well um, uh, behaving in, in the real life. And as there is a saying, the devil is in details. I think this is where the um, concrete panel construction has failed us, um, you know, previously is those details were not very well sought through and technology wasn't there yet. At the moment with the wood construction, the tolerances are so tight and details are so well uh, established that um, putting together uh, buildings like that uh, is becoming a norm. Um, as an example, in here is in Pacific Northwest, both United States and Canada, if we're talking about a structure between five to eight story, wood prefabricated panelized construction or any wood construction is not really competing anymore with concrete or steel. It has became the choice of type of construction for residential affordable housing. There's huge support, realized support from the federal governments, local jurisdictions, city jurisdictions. You take uh, 10 projects supported by the city authorities, I bet you there is seven or eight of them will be uh, mass timber wood construction. Um, it's hard to beat the speed of construction and this is where where the competition of the wood material, wood housing uh, becomes really, really out there um, by minimizing the time of construction. Uh, and this is what is very um, interesting for investors, they're minimizing overall costs. Um, and as I mentioned before, for city, the benefit here is you, you're reducing any disturbance uh, into the city lives. Another area of limitation with construction that we've been seeing over the last 10, 20 years is infrastructural sector. What is beautiful? We want uh, public spaces to look beautiful. And also 
combining the wood with um, other materials, being open-minded and creating hybrid structures, when we start combining steel with wood or wood with concrete, it allows us for very architecturally expressive uh, panelized system that can be quickly installed uh, on site for infrastructural uh, project as well. Wood naturally uh, works well in, in unprotected environment. As long as you have covered wood from direct sun and light, uh, it really, really well um, behaves throughout the, the life compared. There's no issues of rust or there's uh, any other issue associated with the typical um, regular material construction. And I would like to finish up this quick presentation um, on, on, the, on the best quality of wood. It's beautiful. It, it fills us, it makes us feel uh, uh, sheltered and warm in the environments uh, surrounded by wood. But also this quality of wood, let, letting us eliminate any unnecessary coating and finishes in our building which also minimizing the amount of material that goes into construction and, and positively contribute to the reduction of the carbon emission in the construction industry. And that's it for me, Alex. Thank you so much, Yuri. I think uh, that was a great, uh, almost like a summary for our uh, web seminar because we have touched up on the idea that God and devil in, in details, but also thinking about sustainability as well as the first step to the resiliency where actually our, our cities are out now facing. So the future is not only about how we made, but also what experience and how we live in the future. And thinking about the pandemic eventually is crushing our current lives, but a new approach and new reality give us a lot of new tools that can help us rebuild and rethink about the ways how we build, how we live, and how we think about the, our collaboration, but also the quality of our life and the globe and the planet as well as whole. Uh, so to thank you, Yuri, for your amazing presentation, but also I wanna thank everybody, all the att attendees and speakers for such an informative forum and Unfortunately, we do not have much time for questions. So I would uh, uh, ask if you have any questions, any suggestions to submit directly to Serba so our discussion can go on. And in the end, thank you again. And this is, was amazing and turned out to be an excellent session. And I think definitely the whole Eurasian market and, and Russian participants sh uh, should continue our discussion with Canadian side to, to get to the better, sustainable, resilient, and future results as the whole uh, family. Thank you so much.